Thank you, Patrick. That was packed and lucid. Incredibly efficient. I don't know how you did it. Really wonderful. Um, so we now open up to questions, and uh, our innovation last year was that we have a mic for questions. That seems to help things out. And so uh, there's somebody importuning me in the front row. I'm going to get okay. So this is just maybe just a simple semantic question, but sure. it confused me with regard to the motivating logic behind the game that you described that the kids were in, the, the ARG yeah. this summer. Yeah. So you said, on the one hand, they have the opportunity to prevent the end of the world. Yes. But on the other hand, one among them would cause, how, yeah. about, not, how about might cause, if they didn't act in a particular way? So, Do you see what I mean? Right, right. No, no, absolutely. It, it, it was would cause, but what we did is we hired an actor who was 17 and embedded that actor within the player group, and that person ended up causing the end of the world. We, did, we didn't want to traumatize anyone. Uh, and any one of the actual players to think that they had caused this. Okay, yeah. but okay, okay, so that, that solves one <laughs> problem. But then the second problem is, if why would I enter a game when I knew that there's somebody who's going to prevent me from achieving the goal that motivates me to be in the game? Well, well I think I think it created uh, this this atmosphere of, of you know creative paranoia where they thought that they could eliminate that person or identify that person, let's say, before the three weeks had elapsed. So they knew that they had a period of time in which one of their goals became identifying, identifying this, this person, this Even spy. if the identification wouldn't prevent the end of the world. Yeah, but I mean, they, were, they were given a fair degree of hope up front as well. OK. So, so, so there was a high likelihood that they would succeed. I see. So, and we so also, the description uh, uh, wasn't exactly accurate. It, it wasn't yeah. exactly right. And there were other elements to it. So they received this letter, and there was uh, a kind of face-to-face -face orientation session um, where, where different actors were introducing themselves. There was, there was a back and forth in which some of this was clarified, but that's a good point. Well, I have a very general question. Uh, what did they learn? Uh, uh, how did they experience, what, what transformation did they say they had gone through? Uh, what kind of results did you get? Right. Where were they at the end versus where they were at the beginning? You know, all those sure. <laughs> things that you learned from participating in this. Great. Th thanks for that question. Yeah, um, I mean, we've been, we've been uh, following these kids for quite a while. I mean, we're trying to do kind of lo longitudinal research to see how effective the intervention was. And we, we have found that um, a large number of the students were more likely to pursue STEM careers after, um, after going through this camp, which was, which was one of our intentions, was, was to try to get them uh, not only interested in, in taking science courses in, in school, but to see that STEM careers were, I mean, there, there were many different options, being a community epidemiologist, for instance. And so part of the, the camp had them going to different faculty members, to different professionals, asking those people questions and using that information to um, make progress in the game. Um, but the trick was, right, of course, there was this mediating step where they had to meet the health professionals. And by meeting the health professionals, they got a sense of, you know, what somebody who is 10 or 20 years older uh, might be doing with this kind of, kind of knowledge. So that was part of it. Um, you know, I mean, as far as the game itself goes, this is a longer explanation, but also, you know, as I said, with alternate reality games, you don't always explicitly tell them that they're playing a game. This was a little bit more complicated because we had an institutional review board that we had to get this research through. Uh, but we still found a way in which um, we tried to sell them on, on, on the fact that this science fiction scenario was real. And it worked with some of them. I mean, some of them believed that it was real. I mean, there's, there's a longer answer underlying that. but. Um, but the, but the main answer to your question is, is uh, STEM knowledge, career interest. That's the stuff we saw increases in. Any other interesting personal uh, revelations? I'm sorry. Any other interesting personal revelations? I mean, what they said about their own experience, how they felt changed by it? Yeah. So, um, so I, did, I personally did the debriefing. Af after the three weeks of gameplay, um, after there had been this kind of, kind of climactic scenario, um, I went to each group and basically walked them through the fact that they had just taken part in an alternate reality game and for the first time kind of like took off the mask, took off my, my costume and stuff like that. And I had expected, um, you know, essentially everyone who was a part of it um, to, to have known that it was that, that fully that it was game. And in fact, up front, they were told that it is game in the, in the information that they signed with their parents. Um, in every group that I debriefed, 
uh, at least one or two people were utterly shocked, not in a way that they were uh, angry at us, not in a way that they felt uh, like something problematic had happened. In fact, many of them wanted to stay in that alternate reality rather than going back to their everyday lives. We had like, and after that, we had a three-hour debriefing in which all of the actors and designers basically sat in the middle of the courtyard and they could ask us any question they wanted for three hours. Um, and this is interesting because if, when you look at like sociological experiments from people like uh, Harold Garfinkel at UCLA in the 1960s, uh, oftentimes when he would engage what were, what were called breaching experiments, where he would kind of enter an, al an alternate reality with some of his experimental subjects, oftentimes when they found out that they were in the midst of an experiment, they got very mad, partly because there, there had been no informed consent, there had been no uh, debriefing. Um, in our case, nobody got angry. And I think part of it is because of the way that we frame the experience and the way that we debrief them on the other end. Patrick, Patrick, I have a question for you about testing. You mentioned the word test at one point. And um, testing is a big issue in primary and secondary education, even in tertiary education. Um, big issue about teaching to the test, how do you have a standardized experience, level the playing field without teaching to the test. Um, have you guys thought about how games can abet the progress that people were trying to make in figuring out how to design better tests to figure out what's being learned? I mean, the, the interesting thing about games as a form is that they don't require tests. I mean, it's, it's, so, so essentially what happens in the classroom, right, is you have, um, you have this, this series of classes, this series of lessons, and after all that has happened, this external series of tests gets attached to the experience. Like maybe you had a wonderful, playful classroom experience, and then you have to do this thing that looks nothing like what your experience was like. The thing about games is you can't move forward with them until you've, you've mastered or at least developed some skill around what you need to get to the next level. So the test is built into the very form of the game. So in a way, um, the, the, the test is beating the game, if, if the game is well designed. So I think there's something to be done there. Um, I mean, as I was saying, so many of these educational games from the 80s and 90s um, looked very much like standardized tests, right? Standardized tests with, with images. And that's the thing at our lab that we really try to uh, uh, move away from. Um, and the best way that we can, we can think of doing that is just making sure that every level builds on the one before, introduces um, a new challenge that requires some form of learning, and also gives students sufficient motivation to want to overcome that challenge for reasons that aren't artificial in the way that standardized tests may be. Could you rate different levels of performance of different players um, with the kinds of apparatuses that you have? So for our lab currently, no. I mean, I mean, this is, this is the kind of state of the art, is being able to track exactly what every player does. I mean, of course, there's a, there's a dark side to this, which is which different forms of surveillance, for instance. Um, but, there, but there are ways to, to track analytics, to track uh, performance, to track forms of interaction between players. And, um, and I think in the future, we'll probably end up moving into some of this quantitative terrain. But we, we have quantitative evaluators. We don't really have people thinking about quantitative stuff at the level of game design yet. Thank you. I think I'm going to try to get new people in first. Uh, thanks so much, Patrick. Um, I have a question about uh, duplicity um, and about uh, your reliance on duplicity as part of the project. So in this case, people are playing a game, but you're not really telling them they're playing a game. Part of the success of the game is the fact that they don't think they're playing a game, right? And then when it comes to the educational games, the, the less they seem like they're pedagogical, uh, the more successful they're going to be in some sense, right? Um, so I just want to know like, how far that goes. Um, I mean, I can imagine trying to uh, market one of these games as, uh, you know, um, the fastest way to make a million dollars is like the marketing, and it's actually about HIV testing, right? I mean, I'm just interested in the process by which one figures out the right amount of duplicity and the, this question about, um, you know, obviously having to create something that is desirable, that's mm -hmm. the marketing part, um, and, and something that's not going to be quite what someone expects. Right. I mean, that's a really good question. And I mean, I think for me, it comes down to 
and this is the artistry of game design, um, you know, and I say that t totally seriously, is, um, is the way that content and form come together, right? Whenever we're making a game, sure, we do uh, lit reviews, we do these kinds of focus groups and things like that. But we're also, the, the game design and development team is thinking really carefully about what genre, what gameplay genre can we use uh, to tackle HIV or to tackle sexual violence. Um, you know, a platformer like Super Mario Brothers probably won't be the, the best form for taking up a, a issues of sexual violence. Uh, ditto for first person shooters or something like that. And, and of course we have um, hundreds of options in terms of medium specific genres uh, that we can take up. And so there are places where duplicity works, there are others where it doesn't. Um, I mean, with a game like there's, there's the game about neocolonialism that I showed, or the game about Israel and, and Palestine, those are games that aren't particularly duplicitous. They, they tell you what they're about up front, um, but they're so strategically engaging that it doesn't matter that they're teaching you something uh, because they work in their, in their own, um, um, as they are. Versus something like this, like the, like the seed game, I thought we had to be somewhat duplicitous because these are high school students, right? These are, these are high school students from the South Side who didn't necessarily want to be spending their summer learning about science. But at the moment where we, and, you know, and I didn't say anything about this, but in, in this, this upper image here, in this, this kind of bluish room, um, we, we created a set that was supposed to be this time communication device. So this is, it's hard to see in this image, but it's a, it's a bonsai tree encased in glass with wires moving uh, 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 to the sides hooked up to these monitors that have big data essentially going across them. And you can't see this on the ground, but there's grass. So we put grass inside a University of Chicago building. I think this is the first time I'm saying that in public. Um, <laughs> and, and so there was, there was a tactility, there was a visual component, there was a, a sound sphere. Where the, when they moved into this space, um, there was a level of not suspension of disbelief, but production of belief that happened through this kind of duplicitous set. And that allowed them to enter into the as if in a very embodied way. And so here I think it was both effective and arguably necessary to move them outside of their everyday reality. And a lot of these kids were coming from uh, really troubled households, from really terrible uh, domestic situations. So, so some level of kind of transition into another world was necessary. I mean, the other piece of this in this case was also you know, it's the University of Chicago campus, and these were students who didn't feel particularly welcome on the University of Chicago campus, so there was some skepticism about what they might get out of this kind of summer program. So that's where um, a, a semi-deep knowledge of context was really necessary for us to then engage in creating this, this kind of scenario. Uh, but I wanna say that, the, that there is an element of duplicity, but there's also an element of responsiveness that goes into this design. Uh, so the thing I love about this form, I love it much more than video games, is that from day to day, you can make alterations to the design based on what the players are doing. At the end of every day, we would have a one to two hour design meeting where we would take stock of what worked, what didn't work that day. We would write new pieces of narrative. We would introduce new characters. Sometimes we'd even create new sets. Uh, sometimes something so unexpected happened during the day, they would basically have to be up all night uh, rerouting the narrative for the next day. So those were elements, I think, where we took seriously what the players themselves were, were, were telling us and what they were contributing to the shared world as well. And we were trying to play back with them, essentially. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I know, I, I've spoken before, but the other first question is just about clarification. What I'm just stunned by the whole time I'm listening to this is uh, how much it reiterates what the people as you know, I'm in the field of teaching and learning, or was for a long time. Um, the people in the learning sciences know all this about learning that you have put into these games, all right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you're aware of that. Mm -hmm. But it's been virtually impossible, even though there's been all this knowledge out there in the world, to convince educators to implement what we now know about learning in their pedagogy. Okay. Now, for obvious reasons, because it's very intimidating to think that they might have to do something as elaborate as you have done. However, I mean, I think, in fact, it's not if you learn some certain principles and probably about, I would guess, about 10 to 15 percent of our faculty are already doing that and have these mm -hmm. games very much like the Palestine game you yeah. described in the social sciences. They structured their courses around that. Sure. Um, so it occurs to me that what maybe we need is a game 
for educators mm -hmm. that would motivate them to see teaching mm -hmm. as related to this enterprise, you know? Right. I, I think that's, so, so that's one route, is to, to get educators involved. And in a way, this was, you know, this was a, a feasibility study, an acceptability study. We didn't even know if we could pull it off for the five weeks. So, we, so the first round was just like, can we do it and get a little bit of data about how effective it was? But, the, but I think the other route, um, aside from educating educators, is some, you know, I, I don't love this word, but some form of scaling, right? So, so sure, yes, like yes. we've made one, a version of this game that worked for 70 students. We made another that worked for 140 students. I'm now working on a, on a version of a game for incoming first year undergraduates um, that is gonna have to work for 1,600 students. Um, and you know, and scale isn't just like additive. It's not just like adding this many players, adding this many designers. There's also a dynamic change. For a game that's so dependent upon community, and of course like all of our classrooms for those of us who teach are very dependent upon uh, these kind of community collective dynamics, oftentimes that works best at the scale of 20 students or something like that, right, in this kind of seminar format, even fewer if, 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 uh, if possible. And so the question is, um, how do you get some of that kind of utopian classroom space into a game that's accommodating, say, 1,600 students? Uh, so I agree with you. You know, educating educators is great, but another way of, of, of infecting people with this kind of thing is making it work with enough students to make it cost effective. Yeah. Time for one more yeah, question, if there is one. In that case, let me tell you first of all that there's a reception in the back and we can continue the conversation over some wine and other beverages. And uh, we have this expression, don't we, the teaching game, getting into the mm. teaching game. Yeah. I'm very glad that you got into the teaching game, Patrick. <laughs> You're really good at it. Thank you very much. Yeah.